I would like to extend my gratitude to the organizers of this conference, to Michelle Yun and also to the other curators of the Zhao Wuti No Limits exhibition, Anthony Weitz and Melissa Walter. Thank you for their inspiring work and excellent catalog. Uh, for me, uh, this, is a confer this conference is an opportunity to investigate again the history of Chinese artists in France and to focus on a very important of this history, the introduction of Zhao Ti's paintings to the French audience in the middle of the 20th century. In the exhibition, Zhao Ti, No Limits, a selection of paintings allow the visitors to follow the intimate development of Zhao Wuti's artistic life since his arrival in Paris in 1948. But why did Zhao Wuti choose Paris? What was the artistic network which allowed him to exhibit his works? How to understand the local response to his painting? In order to try to answer to these few questions, I would like to investigate the history of major exhibitions of the Chinese artists in Paris since the 1920s in order to understand the significance of the post-war period at the moment of the settling of uh, Zhao Wuti in France and to see the, the significance in the global frame of the artistic exchange between China and the West in the 20th century. So, Zhao Wuti's paintings have been exhibited for the very first time in Paris in 1946. This first exhibition of contemporary Chinese painting of the post-war period had just opened at the Musée Czarnowski, and it did include 17 works by this unknown artist who was only 26 years old and was still living in China. The decision of the curators to have an entire room devoted to Zhao Wuti was already a significant fact in itself. But the way those works were acclaimed by the French press were, was actually the sign of the opening of a new era, quite different from the 1920s and the 1930s, when the first Chinese artist arrived in Europe. So, let's go a little back in history. In the late 19th century France, contemporary Chinese paintings were not included in the Argenaut museums founded in Paris by the collectors who traveled in Asia, as Henri Czernuski and Émile Guimet have had few relationships with contemporary Asian artists despite of their direct contacts with China and Japan, where they traveled respectively in 1872 and 1876. The original display of the artworks in uh, their museums actually demonstrated more interest for Chinese and Japanese religion and traditional beliefs than for Asian contemporary expressions of art. In the early 20th century, the interest for Chinese painting rose dramatically and between 1904 and 1912, no less than three exhibitions were organized in the Louvre, the Musée Guimet and the Musée Czarnowski. But these shows only focused on ancient paintings without artworks attributed, with only artworks attributed from the Song to the Qing dynasty. For Edouard Chavan, and Rafael Petrucci, the distinguished scholars who organized the Musée Czarnowski exhibition, the 18th century seemed to be the last glorious chapter of Chinese painting history, as we can see on those plates of the catalog reproducing the most recent paintings included in the exhibition. The situation changed when Chinese students came to France to study in art academies around 1920. Of course, they did not come to Europe by plane, but by boat, and did stay for many years in France, merging themselves in the cultural and linguistic environment, but also traveling in Europe. 
In this time, the work study program, and later the Sino French Institute in Lyon, provided an official frame for young Chinese willing to study in France. Behind this movement was the prominent personality of Tsai Yuanpei, who besides his interest for all aspects of education, played a special role in encouraging the training in France of future major artists like Ling Fang Mian or Wu Dayu, who became Zhao Wuti's professors at the newly founded National Academy in Hangzhou in 1928. Young artists uh, living in France became involved in different kinds of exhibitions. First, in the Salon in Paris and other cities, later in group exhibitions, in global exhibitions and museums, and finally, solo exhibitions in galleries and museums. Zhao Wuti, who arrived in Paris in 1948, would broadly benefit from the efforts of the first generation of Chinese artists in France to conquer spaces to exhibit their works. So let's have a look at the first group exhibitions. The Chinese artists who came to France as students around 1920 quickly felt the necessity to gather themselves in association and to set up group exhibitions. The first of those exhibitions did not take place in Paris, but in Strasbourg, in the eastern part of the country, in 1924. It was organized by two Chinese associations in a former imperial palace built before World War I, during a period when this part of the country was German. In this large building, which became the office of the Fine Arts Local Administration in 1923, were exhibited no less than 485 objects, besides ancient objects borrowed from Chinese collectors and dealers, were contemporary works by Chinese artists who were studying in France, like Ling Feng Mian, Su Bei Hong, or Fang Tun Bi. If this exhibition does not seem to have induced any uh, acquisition by museum, it was certainly the first occurrence of a new type of exhibition, including Chinese contemporary artists and supported officially by the Chinese embassy in France, once again with the help of Tsai Yuanpei. Another very interesting point in this exhibition was that besides oil paintings, Ling Feng Mian and Su Bei Hong also exhibited ink paintings. Western training and Chinese practice could clearly be identified by the visitors as the two complementary faces of their art. An important thing to consider is also the leading role played by Ling Feng Mian in this exhibition. For the first time, a young Chinese artist was acting as a curator in France, a role traditionally devoted to local and elder artists or professors in the Salon Exhibition Selecting Committees. The ambition of the Chinese artists as curators would develop rapidly when contemporary artists began to act as ambassadors of Chinese art on the international stage. The next year, in 1925, Lin Feng Mian and his friend Lin Wen Zheng had to face the question of the representation of Chinese art inside the larger frame of the International Exhibition of Decorative and Industrial Modern Arts. The Decorative Art Exhibition can be considered as a derivative for, from other global exhibitions like Universal Exhibitions or Colonial Exhibitions. These events played a special role in the history of Paris between the mid-19th century and World War II. And if we take a look at this, at this huge space here, uh, here is the Grand Palais, and all these are the pavilions. 
And if we have a look at this huge, huge space, we can imagine that the place devoted to the Chinese section inside the Grand Palais uh, must have seemed tiny for the visitors. Nevertheless, the exhibition space designed by Leo T. Pia was both fashionable and traditional, as we can see if we consider the dragon and phoenix pattern on the catalog and at the main entrance of this section. If the different rooms were devoted to decorative objects, we can see that Ling Fong Mian paintings were beautifully included here and there in the main corridor. In the catalogue, his masterpiece, Vouloir Vivre, Willing to Live, was reproduced and explained by Lin Wenzheng, who developed a comparative discourse including references to French poets as Charles Baudelaire. Even if the efforts of Lin Feng Mian and Lin Wenzheng were very cohesive, the Chinese section as a whole did not draw a lot of interest from the public, as Craig Clune has noted in an early article on this subject. The 1933 exhibition organized by Su Bei Hong in the National Museum of Foreign Contemporary Schools had a completely different effect. This building, formerly devoted to Jeux de Paume, the tennis ancestor, reopened as a museum in 1922. It was located in a Tuileries Park near from the Louvre. The place was a branch of the Luxembourg Museum, which was since 1818 the institution where the works of living artists were collected by the French state. Since 1861, the Luxembourg Museum was open to foreign artists, and in 1896, the Impressionist masters were included in the collection. Since its opening in 1922, the Museum of Foreign Contemporary Schools had regular and important exhibition devoted to artists from different countries. In 1929, the exhibition of Japanese contemporary paintings was visited and commented by many Chinese artists, like Liu Haisu, who wished that a similar exhibition could be organized for Chinese contemporary artists. But in 1933, it is actually Su Bei Hong who became the Chinese curator of this exhibition of contemporary Chinese painting, besides the French director of the museum, André de Zarrois. Once again, contemporary paintings were exhibited in an historical perspective as the exhibition included early paintings attributed to masters from Song to Qing dynasty. This part of the exhibition was clearly inherited from the exhibition that took place at the Louvre, Guimet or Chanuski museums at the beginning of the century. But the selection of contemporary paintings by Su Bei Hong introduced the most important masters from the leading schools of the modern period. There were uh, the first school represented was Linnan School, with Chen Shuren and Gao Qifeng. Beijing School with Qi Bai Shi. Shanghai School with Wang Yijing and Zhang Daqian. And of course, Nanding School with Su Bei Hong himself. As we can see on this slide, the exhibition included exclusively Chinese ink painting and no oil painting. The decision to focus on ink painting was probably mainly due to the director of the museum, André Desarrois, who wrote in the catalogue that he wished, I quote, to show Chinese contemporary painting, but no westernized work. The paradox was that he was actually working with one of the most prominent westernizers of the 20th century, if compared with previous group exhibition of Chinese contemporary painting, the 1933 exhibition was certainly successful. 
Within the first week, more than 1,000 visitors came to see the show, and the catalogue was reprinted three times. Many newspapers reported the exhibition, and French art critics broadly followed the judgments on paintings expressed by Subéron in the essay he wrote for the catalogue. Before the end of the exhibition, the director of the museum proposed to acquire a dozen of paintings from the exhibition. The selection included Qi Bai Shi, Chen Shu Ren, Zhang Da Qian, Gao Qifeng, and of course, Su Bei Hong. Su Bei Hong, the former student who arrived for the first time in France less than 15 years ago, had managed as a curator and critic to influence successfully the choice of what was going to be the first gallery devoted to Chinese contemporary art in a French museum. This first attempt to collect Chinese contemporary art by a French museum, despite the acquisition of a few oil paintings, was deeply influenced by the development of the Guohua movement in China during the 1930s. Those limits were probably broadly due to the international relationship situation, still dominated by the colonial model and the rise of nationalism in Europe and in Asia. Before the war, all the paintings from the national museums were sent to castle and national museums out of Paris, like Chambord and other in southern France. The empty museum of the Jeux de Paume was used by the German army to gather the artworks seized in France to select and send them to Germany. That maybe explains the reason why the Museum of Foreign Contemporary Schools never reopened and its collection became part of the newly founded Museum of Modern Art after the war. Actually, after the Second World War, a new global order was being defined, inducing the end of the colonial model in Asia. Among the newly founded international institutions like UN and UNESCO, China played a major role. Those new international relations did have a huge effect on the exhibition of Chinese contemporary art in France. First of all, the Chinese artists active in Paris since the 1920s and 1930s, like Pan Yuliang or Chang Yu, were eager to meet the public again. In 1946, the Association of Chinese Artists in France, around Pan Yuliang and Zhou Lin, the leading forces of the association, organized an exhibition at the National Academy of Art showing the works produced during the war. In the main hall of the Academy, Pan Yuliang paintings were exhibited besides sculptures of Hua Tianyou. The same year, the artists of the association also participated to the Musée Czarnowski exhibition of Chinese contemporary paintings. This exhibition gathered 120 paintings, included many works by leading masters of the 20th century, like Qi Bai Shi and Xu Bei Hong. But it also included recent works by, sorry, by Fu Bao Shi, Ling Feng Mian, Zhang Da Qian, Pang Xunxin, oh, Pang Xunxin. Introduce, introducing the most recent trends of Chinese painting to the French audience. Among the organizers of the exhibition were René Grousset, a prominent senior scholar who was the director of the Musée Guimet and Czarnowski, Vadim Elisev, a young curator who had spent the last years of the war in Chongqing, Guo Yoshou, a Chinese official and diplomat who was the first representative of Asia at the recently founded UNESCO, and finally, Zhou Lin, the president of the Association of Chinese Artists in Paris. 
In the archives of the Czernuski Museum, we found evidence that this shared responsibility of the curatorial relationship was the result of difficult negotiations, as there were actually three different exhibition projects at the beginning. Eliseev, who spent the end of the war in Chongqing, was willing to bring artworks from China for the exhibition. He was the one who took Zhao Wuti's works to Paris. Guo Yoshou, who participated with other Chinese diplomats to the large contemporary painting exhibition of Portland Place in Britain, wanted to see the show travel to Paris, where he was a student himself in the 1920s. Finally, Zhou Lin, as the representative of the Chinese artist in Paris, wanted to show the recent works of the association. Strangely, they managed to gather the free project into one. One of the most significant points was that, for the first time, the exhibition did not include any ancient works, as the director of the museum, René Grousset, considered that, I quote, Asian art should not always be considered from the perspective of its past. In the catalogue, his colleague Vadim Elisev wrote that Chinese contemporary art is depending both on national tradition and Western techniques, without trying to reduce Chinese contemporary art to ink painting. Two major problems of the exhibitions organized in the 1930s seemed to have been solved. In the selection of 17 works by Zhao Wuti featuring in the exhibition, oil paintings and ink paintings were actually both included. They were exhibited in a single room, besides the large lotuses of Zhang Datian, and the recent paintings by Ling Fangmian, Zhao Wuti's master. Surprisingly, the paintings by Zhao Wuti were more numerous than the works by Zhang Datian and Ling Fangmian. This has most probably much to do with the high opinion that Elisef had of Zhao Wuti's works, which he described with inspired words in the catalogue. I quote, Zhao Wuti, pupil of Ling Fangmian, shows the rich possibilities of assimilation of a young Chinese artist who never left China. It is without any doubt our heart, and the signature only seems to reveal its foreign provenance. But actually, many of his paintings betray his origin. The landscape under the snow is an extremely interesting attempt to use oil in the way the Chinese use water. Here is his originality, the fluidity of the atmosphere, so difficult to achieve when using, your, when using oil. The warm interest of the young curator was pro broadly shared by the journalist who reproduced his paintings and compared them with works from French modern masters like Dufy. This was perhaps a rather facile description, but it did indicate the extent to which the artist was already attuned to the Parisian art scene. The years of study spent by Zhao Wuti at the Hangzhou National College of Arts with teachers trained in France seem to have predisposed him to view the Parisian scene from an equal footing. Despite the years of war, Ling Fang Mian and Wu Dayu had succeeded in creating sufficiently favorable conditions to enable their students to assimilate the codes of modern Western painting. But unlike other students of the academy, like Wu Guanzhong and Zhu Dechun, who came to Paris during the same period, Zhao Wuti was the only artist of his generation who could boast that his works had already been exhibited in Paris before the time of his arrival. Zhao Wuti actually benefited of 20 years, 20 years of efforts 
to introduce Chinese contemporary art exhibitions in Paris. During the few years between the end of the Second World War and the beginning of the Cold War, this exhibition was, were especially numerous. One of them, a group exhibition of four Chinese artists organized by the Chinese Bureau of Information in Paris in 1948. Oh, this is not too good. Oh, yeah. Provided to the freshly arrived Zhao Wuzi an opportunity to exhibit his works with Pan Yuliang and Tang Yu, who were regarded as the most important personalities among the group of artists who settled in Paris before World War II. For Zhao Wuzi, the 1948 exhibition was the first and last group event organized jointly with the Chinese artists active in Paris in this period. Nevertheless, Zhou Lin, beside his activities as a painter, art critic and president of the Chinese Artists Association, was also the director of a publishing house called Euros. He did edit the Zhao Wuti first printed albums, including the most important book, Lecture of Eight Lithographs of Zhao Wuti by Henri Michaud, the first of Zhao Wuti's lifelong exchange with Michaud, which had the greatest influence on the development of his career. And of course, we can see the, the prints uh, in the exhibition downstairs. Due to the evolution of the international situation, which rapidly led to Cold War, Group exhibitions, encouraged by diplomatic relations, were suspended for decades. Chinese artists, like Zhao Wuti, had to develop an individual way to show their recent artworks. One of the most common and open ways to do so was to participate to the Salon. The Salon exhibitions were named after the Square Salon of the Louvre Palace, which was the place, place where the artists used to exhibit their recent works since the 18th century. At the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, many salons appeared, like the Salon d'Automne, Salon des Tuileries, or the Salon of the French Artists, among others. When Zhao Wuti arrived in Paris, one of the very first places where his paintings were exhibited was the Salon d'Automne, founded in 1903. By exhibiting at the Salon d'Automne, Zhao Wuti was following the steps of Chinese artists like Ling Fang Mian or Chang Yu, who exhibited in the Salon d'Automne since the 1920s. In the time when the first Chinese artists came to Paris, the Salon d'Automne was already widely open to foreign artists. Liu Hai Su ex experienced it in 1929 when his work was selected for the Salon d'Automne. For a Chinese artist interested in modern European art like him, the Salon were the place where he could see original works from the famous modern masters he respected, like Matisse or Durin. Salon were also a subject to describe in the articles he wrote to the Shanghai Shenbao newspaper. And last but not least, a place to show his painting to the French public. Salons were also the place where young Chinese artists who just graduated from French art academies could meet the French public and sometimes win prizes. That was the case of Chang Shu Hong, who was rewarded for this oil painting at the Salon des Artistes Français in 1935. Consequently, the first Paintings by Chinese contemporary painters acquired by the French museums were mainly art artworks that had been exhibited in the Salon. In 
in 1931, this view of the Luxembourg Park under the snow by Leo Haïssou was exhibited at the Salon des Tuileries. The same year, it became the first Chinese contemporary painting acquired by a French museum, the Musée du Jeu de Paume, devoted to foreign contemporary schools. It is very significant that this first acquisition was an oil painting representing a famous park in Paris in a style influenced by Impressionism and Fauvism somewhere between Monet and Vlaminck. The painting style and subject fitted perfectly with the Salon standard of this time. For the curator who selected this work, this painting could easily take place in the museum collection beside the paintings of American and European painters active in Paris in this period. If the Salon d'Automne was one of the most important exhibiting space for Chinese artists of the first generation, this situation changed rapidly after the war. Zhao Wuti only participated twice to the Salon d'Automne. He joined the recently founded Salon of May for the first time in 1950. From 1950 to 1968, it did participate every year to the Salon of May. The Salon, which was reflecting the most recent trends in painting, attracted an international audience and had a particular influence in, a in Asia, particularly in Japan. Other important Chinese artists who came to Paris in the post-war period, like Wallace Ting, Xiong Pingming, did participate to the Salon. But most of all, it was the place where Zhao Wuti could reinforce the contacts which he actually developed inside the chosen artistic network of his galleries. After World War II, it was galleries rather than Salon, which soon became the preferred venues for contact with the public and for recognition from the art milieu. In the 1920s and 1930s, few Chinese artists exhibited in galleries. One exception is the case of Chang Shu Hong, who had a solo exhibition organized for him at the City Lu Gallery in his famous Chinese style building. One of the paintings exhibited, a portrait of Chang Shu Hong's daughter, Chang Shana, over there was actually acquired by the Museum of the Foreign Contemporary Schools. But C.D. Lu was mainly a dealer of Chinese antiques, and this kind of exhibition could not provide a proper introduction into the French contemporary art scene. This situation changed in the 1940s. The young artists who came to Paris after the war had received a complete training in painting in a new art academies founded by their predecessors, Ling Feng Mian and Su Bei Hong. Some of them, like Zhao Wuti or Zhu De Tun, were actually already teaching before leaving China. So they were approaching France in a new way. For them, Paris was not so much a place where they had to train, as a place where they could develop their own personal arti artistic practice. Exhibiting in galleries was one aspect of this personal development. Around 1950, Jouti was introduced to the gallerist Pierre Loeb by Henri Michaud. Loeb had opened his, galleries, his gallery in 1924 and exhibited surrealist painters like Miho and Klee since the mid-1920s. The solo exhibitions organized for the young Zhao Wuzi by the well-established Pierre Lobe Gallery influenced the development of his career. Besides, Zhao Wuzi became part of the network of art artists exhibiting at the gallery, which included Georges Mathieu, Elena Vieira da Silva, or Jean-Paul Riobel. He could then considered 
be considered as affiliated to the lyric abstraction movement and an actor of the French art scene. The rising role of galleries is also visible in the career of other Chinese artists who settled in Paris during the post-war period. Another Chinese artist exhibiting in Paris in this time is Wallace Ting. The young artist arrived in Paris in 1952. Two years later, he had a solo exhibition at the fashionable studio Facchetti. In the early 1950s, Facchetti had been the first gallery to introduce Jackson Pollock work to the French audience. He also organized exhibition for Dubuffet or Karel Appel, the prominent painter for Cobra movement, who remained close to Wallasting. In the late 50s, Wallasting moved progressively from Paris to New York. After presenting his animal sculptures of plate and iron wire in the Salon in 1954 and 1955, Xiong Bing Ming worked with the gallerist Iris Claire, who during this period invented a new type of exhibition with Yves Klein, Tingli, and Armand. As for Zhu De Thun, after exhibiting at the Galerie du Haut Pavé and at the Galerie Henriette Legendre, he joined a group of artists exhibiting at the Galerie Charpentier in 1960 under the name Paris School. École de Paris. This name is revealing of the key role of the galleries into the process of introduction and intro integration of the Chinese artists into the Paris art scene. The theoretical orientation of certain post-war movement, such as Cobra or informal art, and the personal interest of numerous Western artists and critics for Asian calligraphy, then created a climate favorable for dialogue between Chinese and Western artists, which, were clearly, which was clearly visible in the exhibition on view in galleries and museums. The encounter between the poets Michaud and Zhaozi was without doubt a perfect example it was inseparable for the, from the technical experiments of Zhao Wuzi, who, in 1949, turned his end to lithography. When these first etchings were shown to Michaud, the poet immediately wrote to throw text to accompany them. The book, with, uh, which I already mentioned, was exhibited at the Galerie La Une in 1950. The exhibition became the port of departure for a friendly and creative relationship between the author of A Barbarian in Asia and the Chinese painter. The calligraphic gesture, which played a key role in this relationship, was actually at the center of numerous exchange between Chinese artists and their Western counterparts. In 1954, a meeting between Wallace Ting and Pierre Aleshinsky not only gave rise to exchange, but also to collaborations. In observing Ting, Aleshinsky appreciated the posture of the calligrapher leaning over his work, the rhythmic variation of the strokes and expressive possibilities of the Asian brush. The combined inspiration of the two men enabled them to create joint works such as the Divertissement arrangé pour peinture à quatre mains, Divertissement duet, exhibited at the Gallery de France in 1963. Since 1955, Chaouti himself had already joined the Gallery de France which was exhibiting, among, among others, Pierre Aleshinsky, Hans Artung, Pierre Soulage or Christian d'Autremont. All these artists shared a common interest for Asian art. Oh. 
Christian d'Autremont was, like Michaud, a poet inspired by Asian calligraphy. He had observed the creative process of collaborative paintings by Aleshinsky and Ting, and made the statement that the genuine, work, that the genuine author of those works was Ali Ching, an artist who is not European nor Asian, but a synthesis, as both Aleshinsky and Ting tried to learn from each other. Museums were, of course, also concerned by the question of the meeting between East and West. One of the most significant exhibition projects related to this topic took place in the Musée in 1958. The exhibition titled East and West, 50 Centuries of Meetings and Influences, was organized by the UNESCO with the support of ICOM. With more than 450 objects, the exhibition explored the Silk Road, the 20th century chinoiserie, the 19th century Japanism, and finished with a contemporary section where Artun, Tobe, Klein were exhibited besides Isamu Noguchi and Kenzo Okada. Zhao Wuzi was of course, included. This oil painting, dated 1958, was actually the very last one of the exhibition, suggesting that his work was a typical achievement of this period of mutual exchange. In the catalogue, Zhao Wuti was nevertheless introduced as a member of the Paris School and compared with Okada and Noguchi, who represented, I quote, the American school. Categories like East and West, European and American, were moving and being redefined. The exhibition of ink paintings by Tobe in front of oil paintings by Zhao Wuzi was the symbol of this exchange. The national definitions of painting techniques of the pre-war period were outdated and Zhao Wuti was allowed for the first time for a Chinese artist to represent equally Paris and Asia in the same exhibition. This, was also, this is also one of the meanings of the title of the Asia Society exhibition, No Limits. Inspired by Zhao Wuti's first name, it suggests that his artistic achievements are the result of the way he has been crossing physical, cultural, technical and aesthetic frontiers all along his life. As it is mentioned by Ankni Weitz in the catalog, his work has been developing in a space in between. And if we consider the early and mid 20th century, we realize that for Chinese artists, the historical conditions and cultural opening allowing the development of this space in between have been so rare that we can only look at these years between the late 1940s and the mid 1950s as a highly privileged period. I propose, uh, in memory of Zhao Wuzi and as a tribute to the Asia Society exhibition, to call it the No Limit Moment. Thank you. <laughs>